Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Today, I'm going to be speaking with professional coach and published scientist, David Horrocks. David, welcome. Hi, Don. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So good to be speaking with you. Uh, We've known each other for quite some time, so it's an absolute uh, delight to to have you on the show. We're going to be talking uh, all things decision-making, preparation, game preparation. Um, We're going to be talking about deliberate practice, and we're going to be doing so while unpacking a paper of yours uh, that that, that relates to an interview that you had with uh, a particularly good football soccer player from from the past. So I'm really looking forward to to unpacking that paper and, and discussing these topics with you but before we get on to that tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us about your work yeah thanks Dan um, so uh, right now I'm a consultant in the sports and business space I have a passion for sport and I have had for, for 35 40 years now since being a, a young school child uh, I played football probably 24 7 as a kid uh, played for the school played for the town team, played for the county, trials at several professional clubs, played some youth and reserve team football, uh, got to the age of 19, 20, and didn't make it as a professional, uh, but carried on playing as, as an amateur and a non-league player right through till 35, 36 years of age. Absolutely loved the game. Uh, and then started to coach. I, I started on the FA pathway doing level one, level two. And I've been played lots of games. Um, I found the coaching quite easy in terms of understanding the football. What what I found the most interesting thing was the person, because we're dealing with human beings here. So I enrolled at uh, Open University on an introduction to social sciences. I just got this curiosity about people, Mm -hmm. really. Um, And I got a coaching job at Bury Football Club. I then moved to Burnley. Uh, I was working with the youth team at Burnley and we were doing some physical testing at the University of Central Lancashire. Ended up getting in a chat, as you do, with the uh, professor who led the course. He was fascinated with my background. I told him he was at OU. He said, well, why don't you transfer here? I said, well, I can't. I've got a job. He said, yeah, but with your experience, uh, you can probably sort of pop in two, three hours a week get through the course, it'll enhance you, uh, and you can interact with people, which gives you a little bit more in the OU. So I thought, well, why not? Let, let's give it a go. Um, I ended up spending about seven, eight years <laughs> at the University of Central Lancs. I did a degree, uh, I enrolled on a PhD, did Master of Philosophy. I published about three, four papers, and uh, all that stemmed from doing a level two coaching certificate, really. So... <laughs> <laughs> That's a snowball effect and a half, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah. And I've I've worked in football uh, ever since that, really. Uh, worked in football clubs as a consultant on the support services side. So initially, years ago, that was sports science, really. It was the real early days of performance analysis, heart rate monitors. Mm. And because I could coach as well, uh, I was an easy employee because there wasn't the massive numbers of staff back then. Uh, so to have someone who could sort of dabble in all areas of science, psychology and coaching was, was a godsend. And I worked as an assistant youth team coach at, at Burnley, at Bury, um, and progressed from there, really. And, and ended up realising my dream at some point. I, w- I worked at Manchester United for three and a half years. That was probably the culmination of, uh, of football in not so great times for Man United. But we we finished second in the Premier League, we got to a European final, which we lost on the 22nd penalty. Uh, but such are the demands and standards. That gets you the sack these days. <laughs> what were you doing at Manchester United, David? I was in research and development. So okay. with sort of the wide background I had, the, the club's that big. They actually had 270 staff at Carrington. And you've got a lot of practitioners in strength and conditioning, in psychology, in recovery, in rehab, in analysis. And in years gone by, when I wrote this particular paper and the one associated with it, United really were 
a forerunner. They were an innovator. Uh, mm. They were ahead of many clubs. And that had dropped off. So Ole Gunnar Solskjaer brought me in. Because what they found, the demands of the modern day, the heads of these departments, let's say the head of science or the head of analytics, they've got so much on the plate being involved in the day job. So their continual professional development or understanding what's out there in the world is difficult for them. Uh, and not only that, so sort of when, when you're at a top club like that, finding an edge is not easy, even though they're underperforming at the yeah. time. So if the head of a particular department is to engage on a pathway of finding best practice, the first 99 things out of 100 that they see might be no use to them or they've already tried them. So they, you, at that level, you can spend a lot of time wasted, really. And it, it, in the context of daily operations, it, it becomes not wise to want them to do that. Uh, so with, with my expertise in various areas, coaching, analytics, science, and understanding playing, because I've played, I've been injured, I've had seven operations, so I understand rehab. I was the ideal candidate, really, to go out into the world. And I, I looked at other football clubs. I spent time in Germany. I spent time in America. Engaged with NBA, NFL, motor racing, golf, tennis, uh, industry as well. You know, companies such as Google, Netflix, that type of thing, oil companies. And you're just looking for marginal gains, really. What gives you an operational edge? And uh I loved it. It, it was uh, it, it was great. It was sort of your, your hobby comes to life. At that time, did you feel, and obviously, you know, answer what you feel comfortable answering here, but did you look around those experiences you had in other organisations, other sporting bodies and other sporting clubs? Did you feel that there was a lot out there that could be brought back to Manchester United or did it become apparent that actually, you know, we're doing quite a lot of good good stuff here that, you know, there isn't a magic ingredient out there? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, and I think there's a bit of both. There are things that have been implemented in the club uh, that are brought back. So it, a difference has been made. Uh, at the same time, it's well documented. They've been in a transition period for a long time. Uh, mm. th their target is to win the Premier League and to win the Champions League. So that tells you alone that they are behind. Uh, and, and you look at media commentary, academic commentary, TV, radio, wherever you go, every pundit, every journalist has got an opinion on, on why they're behind. Uh now, clearly, there will be some credence in that. Uh, some of it is flight and fantasy because uh, they are high performing. You know, like we finished second and we lost the European final on the 22nd penalty. So, you know, even though it's failure, you're one of the best teams in Europe at that particular time. But the, the targets are high. Absolutely. Uh, and I think there's a new, well, there is a new regime just come in now. There's Sir Jim Ratcliffe has taken his chairholding. Yep. The well-known Sir Dave Brailsford has come in, uh, who's particularly keen on best-in-class and marginal gains. And without being in the football club, just like you, I read what's in the media, uh, changes have been made. So the fact that those changes have been made tells you that there are areas for improvement. Yeah, I just, I think obviously I can't speak to Manchester United at all, but being fortunate enough to get the opportunity to work across sport at the coalface at the adult elite at the professional level i get to like like you have over the years get the opportunity to be in these environments and i think sometimes you know a certain sport thinks other sports are doing things so much better so maybe football can be and, and there's definitely things you can borrow from other sports there's no question about that and dialogue across sports is so essential uh, and you know that better than i do but uh, i think that you know football might look across the nba and or, or formula one or um or, you know any other sport like tennis or golf or something I think wow, they do that so well there the way they go about things there that that must mm. be that must be so professional but you can guarantee those sports look at football or other sports and think oh, yeah it's, it's everybody's looking at each other and I think sometimes everybody thinks that the other sport has it so so sussed and sorted oh, they know? do they do 
Yeah, we, we have more requests for visitors uh, and we let a lot in as well. So we, we, you're exactly right. We have people in from rugby, people from psyching, people from business, people from government and military. So they're always looking at you as well. Uh, and you've got context. You, you might see something that works excellently in NFL or golf. Yeah. Will that fit in yeah. uh, to the workday and week and operational schedule of a football club? Uh, it, it's not always necessarily so. Well, you're a man with great curiosity, and so um, I'm not too sure if you engaged in this paper while you were at Manchester United. I assume you were, or you are in and around the club at that time. You wrote a, a paper alongside colleagues entitled Preparation, Structured Deliberate Practice, and Decision-Making in Elite Level Football, the case study of Gary Neville, the one and only Gary mm-hmm. Neville. And you wrote this uh, alongside uh, Jim McKenna, Amy Whitehead, Paul Taylor, Andy Morley, and Ian Lawrence. Now, I can take a a good guess or a great guess as to why Gary Neville was a fascination uh, to you, David, and why you wanted to have a conversation with him, interview him formally, unpack how he became so good, how he went about things as as a professional player for Manchester United and for England. But tell us a little bit about the beginnings of of this research. Why Gary Neville, and why were you interested in, in these main themes? Yeah, in, well, in terms of the themes, when I first started on the academic journey, I came across the 10,000 hours theory. Uh, 10,000 hours or 10 years yeah. leads to expertise. Yeah. Now, I'd been on a football journey and not become an expert or a professional. So I'm sat there as an academic thinking, I'm damn sure I've done 10,000 hours. <laughs> I had that as a goal for as well, David, definitely. I only did 20,000 hours, 30,000 hours. Anyway, sorry. (laughs) Exactly that. So I wanted to understand that first and foremost. Mm. Uh, And that also led me to the deliberate practice part of the 10,000 hours in terms of the context of the 10,000, what they look like. What is clear is that people at the top are committing a lot of hours. There's no doubt about that, uh, and the deliberate practice size of it, side of it talks about the specifics of those hours. What do they look like? What's the rationale for doing what you're doing? What's the objective? What do you expect to come from it? Uh, and if it works or if it doesn't work, what do you do about it? So that, that fascinated me, uh, and I read quite a lot of papers which you're introduced to at the start of the uh, undergraduate journey. And I found a lot in elite football, elite sports. Mm. And as I started to dig deeper into them, I thought this paper could be with aspiring university players or it could be with one example I found was Turkish second division. And these sort of went on and on. And I thought, are they really elite? (laughs) Who are the elite? And I, I'm mindful of respecting the fact that the high achievers and the professionals, um, and, and I was a lot of my friends went on to play professional football and they played Premier League, and I knew that they were different to me. So I know that there's differences. And I thought, I need someone who's got to the top here uh, mm. to really be able to unpack what this is. Uh, and fortunately, I, I knew Gary through a a mutual friend. I've watched a lot of him. I had a lot of contact with him growing up and followed his career. Uh, and he was coming to the end of his career, but he was still actually playing. Uh, this was in his last season when the interviews were conducted. So he was the ideal candidate because he he'd played 602 games for United. He'd won eight Premier Leagues. So there was serial winning in there. It wasn't just a one-off. He'd won the Champions League and he'd played for his country 85 times. Uh and as you alluded to earlier, he's very vociferous, opinionated, uh, <laughs> and quite a free engager, Yeah, really. He just sort of leaves his material out there and you make what you will of it. So I thought, he's a good subject. And then on top of that, I suspected that a lot of the deliberate practice in the 10,000 hours was talking about physical engagement. So whether this is piano playing, it's physically playing a piano. If it's art... It's painting. And I'm thinking, I think people think about it perhaps just as much as they do it. So let's sort of ask the question and dig into the mind here. Because I I also know 
that a lot of these top athletes, when they're actually in the peak of their careers, there's a lot of recovery involved and they don't train that much, but they're still able to perform really highly. And when they are recovering and they're not training, I I know that they're not down the supermarket anymore. They're not playing golf. They're not on holiday. So what are they doing? (laughs) Uh, And it transpired, yeah, there's a hell of a lot of thinking going on they are seriously considering what they do, what scenarios they're going into and how they may prepare for that. So that was the catalyst to it, really. I wanted to unpack the thinking. And and then obviously that took me deeper and further and further. So in very simple terms, you sat down with Gary Neville and started asking him questions. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. Uh, it, it, The interview was conducted at his house. It was a relaxed situation. We sat in his front room. It was about four hours. And it was a general conversation around a set of themes in terms of his football career and how does he go about it. And I I was mindful not to labour the point up front about thinking and deliberate practice because I didn't want him to answer in a way that he presumed I would like him to answer. So it was a a discussion about his career, really, and his life. So I just sort of, it it was how do you become a football player? How do you then operate as a football player when you're successful? Mm -hmm. What does each day look like? What does a week look like? So the big question sort of when you were young, what did Monday to Sunday look like? When you were 24 and at your peak, what did Monday to Sunday look like? And then prompting all the time, can you give me an example of what that day of Monday entailed? So if you were, tra- what did training look like? Why were you doing that? He might say, and then I stayed behind after. Uh, why? Why did you do that? What did you do? Who were you with? Were there any benefits to that? Uh, did you have a goal? Or was it paranoia? Uh And there was all sorts of mixed answers coming out all the time, really. So it was quite open in terms of the very pertinent question was why and how. So this is fascinating stuff. Before we unpack the kind of things that he said to you, you've alluded to this being a sort of a general conversation about his career, his experiences in the academy, and then into the first team. Um, but those three themes run through. So preparing for a game, the deliberate practice side of things, but also decision making, um, which you haven't mentioned so far. So can you unpack that a little bit? Why mm-hmm. the theme of decision making? Is that linked for you to deliberate practice and related to game preparation? Um, were there were any sort of scientific theories that you were using to inform uh, the unpacking of the results around decision-making? Yeah, can you just talk a bit to decision-making in football? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, the theme decision-making itself uh, was appearing a lot in commentary, whether that be on TV with pundits, with presenters, or whether it's with footballers in the studio. Uh, Because a lot of the top games, which we all like to watch, the teams are evenly matched. So in the day, that might have been Liverpool, Man United. Now it could be Manchester City, Arsenal, uh, Arsenal, Liverpool, etc. And the players are pretty evenly matched. You could take one player from one team, put him in the other, and it wouldn't make a great deal of difference. And what often came out at the end of these type of games was, well, it was toe-to-toe, it was neck and neck, either team could have won it, but ultimately this team made the better decisions. And that type of thing kept coming out and out. And that might then go into specifics. Uh, We look at the game that's just passed this weekend, the Manchester derby, Uh, and it was mentioned as well, Phil Foden, uh, who got man of the match, scored a couple of goals. There was a little piece that I saw on social media in terms of, at the end of the day, it was very difficult, but Phil was able to make better decisions in the key moments to unlock. So that narrative was there all the time, but there's nothing behind it. This word decisions just kept appearing. So this was deeper into the interview. So we, we're talking past the academy bit here and it's probably at the area where he's 24, 25, where he's at his peak really. He's winning Premier Leagues. 
uh, he's winning Champions Leagues and getting to the latter stages of European competition. So I asked him about that. Uh, and it was interesting in terms of, he said, the level's high, the, the standard's high, uh, and the players that you're playing against are pretty good. So you need to have full concentration, first and foremost, but you need to have full preparation because that concentration has to be quite specific to the task that you're going into and the opponent that you're facing. So I thought, well, that's interesting. How, how do you go about that? And he relayed a, a particular interesting story. He said, one day a guy came down to me with an Apple Mac thingy. <laughs> I said, ah, right, that's interesting. Yeah. And he showed me some clips of a winger running at me. Uh, and he watched them, curious as he is, and said, thanks very much, and left it there. And he went away to think about it and thought, if I'm watching clips of a winger running at me, I'm in trouble here. This is panic. I need to know more. So he said, I went to find the guy with the Apple Mac thingy who... <laughs> had edited and provided these clips of the wide player running at defenders and said, I'd like more. Where does he get the ball from? How does he receive the ball? So he started to trace the match backwards because he, in reality, he didn't want to counteract the winger running at him. He actually didn't want the winger to have the ball, so he didn't have to counteract it in the first place. So he started watching video of... Where does play build up from? Is it the goalkeeper? Is it the centre-backs? How do they receive it? Is it thrown to them? Is it passed out to them? Do they receive it across the body? Do they then look up? Do they take it on the right foot or the left foot? What's their preferred pass? Is it into a player or is it beyond the player for them to run onto? And he started to think about how he could shut things down at source and how he could utilise other players within his team to make that happen. And it, it, later on, we talked about great performances. And again, he laughed and he said, sometimes you used to open the papers and it might say, Neville, five out of 10, very little involvement in the game. And he, <laughs> he said, those were my best games ever because the reporters want blood and thunder and tackles and clearances because I'm a right back. He said, but if I've controlled everything at source, there's nobody running at me and I have nothing to do. So I'm literally playing a mental game due to the preparation prior that allows him to make decisions and almost conduct an orchestra really in front of him in terms of, can you press there? Can you shut that run down? Can you close this avenue off? Uh, and developed a relationship with people inside him that could have been Ferdinand, uh, Vidic, it could have been Beckham, Ronaldo in front of him, gigs on occasions, skulls just inside him, where the whole team worked as a unit. Um, and they had this work ethic as a group as well at Manchester United, whereas it was a bit like I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. So in return for that, if Beckham or Ronaldo had the ball, Gary would run past them as fast as he possibly could. And he said, I didn't really want the ball, uh, but it would create space for them. So they might get a cross in or it might, they had two defenders on them. I took one with them, that type of thing. So there was a fantastic relationship within the team as well to affect the tactics uh, and the setup of teams that they were playing against in both the situations of them being in possession and out of possession. But the source of this was all cognitive and he was one of the catalysts for that because I think we can see this now, to be honest, with his business involvement and his politics He's a thinker and he, he's still the same guy today that we see on television or on Dragon's Den that I saw as a 23-year-old football. He seriously thinks about his game. So I'm therefore unpacking a massive part of this 10,000 hours or almost Gary walking in the park, sat in his chair at home or even asleep, thinking about solving the conundrum that is a football match that's going to evolve in front of him. And he just ultimately said that the, the more I know, the better decisions I make. And that then took me back into the theory of academic works. What is information processing? How do people make decisions? What is working memory? What is long-term working memory? 
how do those combine and act and play out in a live football game? And they were clearly present. His long-term working memory was all the football that he'd watched, all the football that he'd talked about, uh, the football matches that he'd played in, the training sessions that he'd been in. So in that long-term working memory, you've got right-footed, right-sided players, left-footed, right-sided players, fast players, slow players, tall players, physical players, technical players, skillful players. Um, he'd sort of say mild-mannered players or angry players because he dealt with those different as well. So he's just filling up this filing cabinet, really, for want of a better word, that then interacts with his working memory when he's on the field of play to sort of recognise situations and think, I've seen that before, so therefore this is what I'll do. And sometimes he might see two or three things and it's sort of, oh, right, he's received it in this way, but his body shape's like that. So he could have two, three pieces of information and then the long-term working memory would identify three pieces. So the working memory would then say, right, I'm going to choose piece number two because that's the most important for me as I feel right now. So I, I I sort of almost didn't have a football player sat in front of me at this point. I had a machine. I had an information processing machine, really, that was a database of football and football player scenarios where he had to select one that would solve the problem. And I, I think that's probably the best analogy I can give, really, in terms of the decision-making process that I identified. There's so much rich detail there, David, and so many different pathways I can go. I'm going to reflect a few things back to you with relation to some of the episodes on the Sports Psych Show, um, and then perhaps tease a little bit more out of you with regard to that cognitive side and maybe get some opinions from you. Mm -hmm. It's just so fascinating, isn't it, that Gary Neville, when he watched those clips, didn't stop there. And he wanted to see more clips. He wanted to make sense of what had been going on on the pitch that led to those moments when he's 1v1. He's not saying to himself, okay, mm -hmm. 1v1, I've just got to win that 1v1. He's saying to himself, well, as a team, we can potentially stop that. And, I, and I'm starting here because we've recently had Katie Crawford on the show, who's doing a PhD on teamwork at the University of Bath, working on the teamwork model that Desi McEwen and Mark Beauchamp have created over in Canada. And that teamwork model in very, very simple terms, because it's quite broad, um, has three C's central to it, communication, coordination, and cooperation. Mm -hmm. And as you were speaking there, it was making me think of immediately, although he wouldn't necessarily articulate yeah. it like this, immediately Gary Neville was going, well, I'm looking at this clip and I'm thinking, how can I, how can I use this information to coordinate and cooperate and communicate better with my with my teammates so I just think that's fascinating and as you, you kind of within what you were saying alluded to that this was a player-led changing room so it demonstrates the importance of players taking ownership for their game but then using the information that they've stockpiled to then potentially communicate with their teammates and coordinate and cooperate better with them and as you were speaking it was making me think of you know we talk about transformational leadership but it also make, makes me think of transformational relationships across the team you know as you said they helped each other yeah it's funny you should mention that because I also spoke to the first team coach at the time as well mm. that was Mike Phelan uh, yeah. and I, I work with Mike now and he would say that within that dressing room at times players would make decisions and they would make decisions on the field so something might be happening after 20 minutes and there's clearly been tactics and preparation in training and before you enter the game. And he might say, I'm going to play slightly higher or I'm going to bring Rio closer to me. And the coach would say, okay, that's fine. Now, I often look at modern football at times when there's a problem. You see the players looking at the bench saying, help me out yes. here. Or maybe from the negative side, that's what you told me to do. Yeah. Uh, but this particular group of players would take serious responsibility. Um, and I saw an interview with John Stones actually last week. They're the serial winners at the minute, Manchester City. And John said exactly the same thing. Uh, the interviewer was talking about their game plan. And he said, 
yeah, we have a game plan, but do you know what? At this level, there are times where you've got to innovate and back yourself and make a decision and do what you feel is right because it's you that's in the fire. And that that was fascinating for me because they're now at the top of the tree, but the same processes are happening that were happening in United serial winning days. Do you think, David, that stems from top-down autonomy-supportive coaching, leadership, autonomy-supportive management? Yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, there were standards within the environment. Yeah. Uh, Sir Alex and his coaches set those. But once you're on that ship and you are – conform is probably the wrong word. Once you're a part of that culture, you are also trusted – as an individual or as groups within the group. So it becomes a collective and a collaborative. And they often use words, uh, the dressing room, and that dressing room drove us on. That dressing room that I was part of one year after year. So the dressing room for me is a group of people. It's a collective, it's a culture, and there are standards and behaviours in that that are managed and self-policed, for want of a better word, because I've sort of been involved with the United, both in the research and I've worked there in the past, and I've seen lots of people sort of speak and read autobiographies. And people ask about Fergie's leadership or the coach, and quite often players will say that dressing room managed itself. Yes, if there was something that needed saying from the top, then it would be done because you've got a great leader there. But by and large, Ferguson's strength was to create a dressing room that managed and policed itself and kept progressive high standards. And that's what Steve McLaren told me when I worked at Derby County with Steve back in eight years ago. He would tell me a number of stories about the the climate, the environment, the culture and the characters in that change room when he was there, which was... was the end of the 90s so Gary never would have been very much a, a fixture at that time mm-hmm. and it was very much the same or similar message from him that it was very much a, a player-led changing room and yeah. there wasn't much room for for maneuver in terms of as you say the behaviors it was you know it, an interesting identity piece you know this is Manchester United this is what we do here and I know that there's been some Mickey taking historically from various comedians around mimicking Gary Neville sort of saying this yeah. is Manchester United this is Manchester United but I, I can understand why in his punditry he's referred to that as a statement because that's it's literally it's a definition it's an identity piece isn't it David it is and it, it's the culture and the behaviors that are behind those words when him or it's Roy Keane now saying this is Manchester United uh, it's up to people like us to unpack that mm. so what is Manchester United and sometimes you, you would you want the TV presenters to ask that question because there is a lot of depth in there uh, and a lot of behaviours and nuances on, on, on many levels that uh, that make them what they are. Just, there's the teamwork that I detected from what you were saying, the teamwork piece, just honing in on that that cognitive piece, the, the, the perceptual cognitive piece. I mean, it, what you were saying, what Gary Neville engaged in there reminded me of my uh, conversation on the Sports Site show it's episode 175 with uh, Dr. Michael Ashford, who's done some great research into uh, decision making. And his research talks about actions mm-hmm. for decisions. He talks about uh, slow thought decisions, fast thought decisions, and no thought decisions. So he's gone quite yeah. in depth there. Um, but it was it was making me think of, I and mean, we can talk about the importance of session design, coach session design, in order to improve player decision make- making. We can talk about, you know, instruction approaches whether it explicit instruction demonstration and so on and so forth um, as ways to improve player decision making but obviously you've spoken a lot about uh, Gary Neville there going away watching footage watching footage of opponents and you've said quite a lot today already about thinking 
thinking the game, thinking the situations, thinking the context, mm-hmm. thinking the opposition, thinking teammates, which I think is really interesting. And and I suppose if we borrow from the, the mental imagery literature, it could be that as one thinks, you know, your brain is firing the same patterns as if one was doing it. Well, it, it's funny you should mention that, Dan, because in the interview, when I asked him mm. to describe certain scenarios of his thinking, he got up and he started moving around the room. <laughs> How funny. And he, he, he was, he said, he, he sort of, this is a scenario, the ball's coming from there. So he's jockeying back in his front room and then all of a sudden he'd run forward. And I've stimulated a thought process and that has fired all the neurons. He's got up and for about 15 minutes, he's actually running around his front room talking to me about <laughs> football. Which, You're sitting there watching him just running around his front room. Well, it was fascinating. But yeah. for me as an academic at the time, I'm, yeah. that is just confirming the process that you've just described and asked about really in terms of the brain is inextricably connected to the muscular system, the nerves, the neurons are firing. And it is stimulating action. And that's because these thoughts, he's got pictures in his head. Uh, I, I dare say if he was wired up, his heart rate would have increased. All these physiological things were coming about because I'd stimulated thought in his head. Yeah. I, I, wow. This just opens up another world. It's absolutely fascinating. And, and it makes me think I'm really passionate these days about the 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 embodiment of thought which is basically what you're saying there to 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 embody uh, what you want to do and who you need to be to enact it and it's just fascinating that you mm-hmm. were sitting there watching Gary Neville this world famous <laughs> fullback just talking to you but almost not being able to contain himself because you could argue that thought is action and action is thought in many respects it's it, i yeah. understand you could you can isolate them of course you can but um he's i actually see it on tv now obviously because of experience but if he's in commentary or post game behind the desk with let's say kelly cates hmm. and he'll sort of say well i think such and such a player's got to get tighter if you watch him as he says that he makes a motion yeah. and he moves forward yeah. and he's quite gesticulative in a lot of his commentary. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, you saw it with um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, um, at the time of this recording, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Jesse Marsh was on Monday Night Football describing yeah. Yeah. the the process that the Red Bull clubs utilise the, the the tactical uh, approaches and game models that they use, and he couldn't help himself. But you know, when he talked about defensive body position, he got himself onto his front foot, ready to take action. Um, yeah. And and for me, that's aligned with approach behavior. I talk a lot to coaches about the importance of uh, behavioral inhibition and behavioral activation. Behavioral activation being the work of Jeffrey Gray in the 20th century and big part of personality is on the front foot. It's energy forward. It's a readiness and alertness Mm -hmm. to, to, to take action. Um, so it, it's amazing how when these people are describing this, they, they have to position themselves in, in that embodied pose. Yeah, it, it's, it really is fascinating to watch. And he, he talked about that as well at the time. It, it, all this thinking is to go into an environment, the 76,000 fans there, <laughs> it's high intensity. A lot of the games... All the teams want to knock United off the perch. Uh, the big games at the time because they were consistently getting deeper and deeper into European competition. And the preparation and the decision making, it was for a readiness to win. It was for a readiness for action. It was for a readiness to solve the problems and solve the issues, but get on the front foot and create victory for that particular team. So all thought was to do with action and and they'd coupled together on the training ground. He mentioned things such as this was a defensive scenario and it goes back to sort of the winger coming at him. If he knew a particular winger was tricky, he would work with someone else in the team. And the example he gave was Nanny. I might just spend five minutes with him, get someone to feed Nanny some balls and get him to run at me because he knows that's a style of player that he's going to, so even in training, he's connecting thought to physical activity. Uh, 
And his goal was to to want to physically experience as much as he possibly could. And he, he talked about the feeling of having been there before. And in the paper, there's a, a mention of Terry Venables. He said Venables, when he was England coach, said that each game you play, you should have already played it once before mm. in your mind. And, and Gary said that was key to his career, really. He said Terry was a fantastic coach, but he wanted that feeling when he was in the sort of gladiators environment, for want of a better word. He wanted to feel like he'd been there before and therefore he had the answer. I can quote that uh, quote, actually. I can uh, read that quote. Uh, Gary Neville said, I think that having a picture of the match before you play it, I think the, the first person that I heard say that was Terry Venables in 96 or 95 when he was England manager. He said that his job as a coach was to almost, in our minds, have us going into the game having felt like we had already played it. Yeah. Which, again, this, well, 96, you're looking at towards 30 years ago there. Uh, there are things in the paper as well on the academic side, which talks about how cognition and cognitive training will be the future of football. Uh, I think it's Tony mm. Strudwick that I quote. Simply, he puts it that physical prowess is probably plateauing. Uh, and he makes the uh, position that tools will be developed. Now, this was pre things such as virtual reality. And virtual reality is now here with us. So that's probably yes. the newest stage of performance analysis. Um, and you can now go into a VR situation where you can experience the game. Uh, it will be at live speed. You will be in the stadium that you are going to go in. So that the bridge is closing uh, as time progresses, really. So you, you've now got the physical bit. You've got the analysis, which is the computer, the TV screen. You've got the VR, which is a halfway house between the two. And the worlds that we in psychology have always posited and claimed that are inextricably linked are now looking more and more so in the physical world in terms of the things that we have at our disposition to prepare. And we see that with things such as flight simulation pilots. We see it with surgery as well. Uh, you, you can't practice open heart surgery uh, because we don't have many volunteers that would like to get opened up. Uh, but in VR, we can replicate these situations and bring it more to life. Uh, so interesting how it's developed. Well, I, I, I suppose it leads me to my next question because, you know, you might refer to VR in, in the answer this, to this question. Can anybody do this? And I'm talking about the decision making here because you've interviewed Gary Neville one of England's greatest ever defenders. Um, and, you know, he's talked to you through how he went about this. And it just makes me think, well, are there numerous other players who go about doing this, but don't necessarily have the same, but it doesn't necessarily have the same impact on them. And just before you answer me, I think of two recent experiences I've had uh, around people who were world-class at their time. So I've had the pleasure of working closely with Robin Van Persie uh, in my work at Feyenoord, and he would say exactly the same things as Gary Neville, you know, obviously at the other end of the pitch. Uh, and that he, it was when he arrived at Arsenal and was working under Wenger and he had some insight into what he felt he needed to do from a decision-making perspective. And it's really interesting what you're saying about Gary Neville because he would say he would say the same things about, well, you know, what when Fabregas goes this way, and we were talking about Arsenal two decades ago, when Fabregas goes this way, I need I know I need to go that way. You know, to put it in very basic terms, he would really calculate what his uh, teammates were doing and then start to really think that mm -hmm. word again, think about what he needed to, to do to interact effectively with them. And it also makes me think of uh, some footage I saw of Rude Hullet speaking the the former Dutch international player and, and 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 coach and he said when he went to Chelsea for the first time when he turned up as a player and in those first few training sessions when his teammates at that time and I think we're talking sort of early to mid 90s here uh, experienced his dis his quick decision making process his teammates would say to him you know Rude you you always know where to stand you always know where to be you always know what space 
to, to feel. And it, he sort of describes that as well, but since I was a kid, you know, I've been I've been thinking about this, and I've been, you know, I, I just yeah. I've seen it so many times now. I know where to be. Yeah. But can everybody do that? I mean, not everybody can be quick. Not everybody can be powerful. We know that. Not everybody can have the world's greatest ball control but could everybody go through this decision making process uh, I think it's a great question and I, I think the answer is no I, I agree yeah. with you uh, there, there are different levels of performance uh, across the human race in anything that we do whether that's a, a child at school learning maths who's yeah. had the same instruction same classes same yeah. time but one will perform better than the other and um, and I think a lot of that sort of been explained to me by because I've asked this question myself. Or Gary was quite focused in this is the way he's going to operate. So if we think about bandwidth, he's dedicating a lot of bandwidth to it. Other people might be doing three, four, five different things. So the bandwidth drops specifically to each of those things that they're doing. Um, some players develop that sort of standing in the right place earlier so some might have it at 19 20 others might pick that up at 26 27 uh because there, there was the old adage in football of he's got loads of talent he'll be a great player when he's got 200 games under his belt yeah. and i always used to think well you can watch 200 games <laughs> you think about vr now you could go in 200 vr games yeah. so there are ways of getting there quicker mm. And there's learning methods and learning styles as well, which is sort of, it's contentious in the academic literature, but people will, I, myself, I like to listen to things. Uh, when I read things, uh, my concentration level's low. I might read for three minutes and then put it down, have a brew and start again. I think if I go out for a run and listen to something, I can run farther than my body will actually take me. So it's, <laughs> and I think a lot of it is to do with that engagement. Or even when we go back to the culture, uh, because Gary and uh, other coaches that I've worked with and other people for that environment would describe other players and say, well, they didn't do that particular work, mm -hmm. but they were still in the culture. So they were in the dressing room. So there were other things going on. So implicitly, they're soaking up information or seeing practice. And sometimes seeing practice is just as good for someone as it is for the other person that's in the practice because mm -hmm. they'll just get that and they'll be able to execute it when they go out there. Uh, some need to train to the nth degree. Some prefer not to train. They want to rest and maintain the body because they're quite confident in terms of the way they're processing things. So in short, the answer to your question is everybody is different. Uh, we can offer it as a learning medium. And if some people want to take that up, and follow that type of behavior, it may work for them and it may improve them. Uh, for others, it certainly won't do them any damage or any harm, and it won't do them any damage or any harm to be in a culture with people that are doing different things. Uh, and I've, I've, I've had players that have actually started to think more when they've been injured because they can't do anything else. So by accident, they then think, ah. Oh, I'll watch some football. Mm. I can't play anymore. And there are footballers that don't watch football, believe it or not. Uh, but then all of a sudden they start. And then you find that days or weeks later, they'll actually ask questions because they're using a different part of their physiology or their mind. And they're starting to think, why does he do that? Why does he run there? So it can come at any moment in life and it can come implicitly because of the environment, let's say the injury, or it can become, which I would describe Gary and level as more purposeful and deliberate practice. He's gone out and think, I'm going to follow this pathway and this plan because it's going to give me the answers. Whereas the other examples have given you, have fallen into it through the culture that they're in. So it's then implicitly become a part of their preparation, whether they know it or not. You might be surprised, it, interesting listening to you, and you, you might be surprised that I remember this. I, 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 many years ago, I remember you showing me, and this we won't 
name this player. I mean, you can do if you want to, but I, I, I certainly won't. But you showed me a, 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 a small passage that this player, that I think you would got this player to write for you, that detailed a passage of play um, in detail. And yeah. sort of it, it was, I think, what you were trying to do is you were trying to get him to reflect on what he was doing, reflecting on action to improve his, his awareness, yeah. his, his knowledge in the game, his knowledge about the game and so on and so forth. And that as a, that as a process to do exactly what we're, we're speaking to here. And I've done that over the years and it's amazing how some players are so receptive to that. They get it and it becomes a part of what they do and they feel it helps mm-hmm. them. Whereas others either through a little bit of low conscientiousness or laziness might be the other term to to, to put to that, <laughs> or just maybe even just unable to connect the dots between I'm writing this down, but this feels, use that word again, instead of embodied, disembodied. And so it's not as meaningful to me. There's, yeah. there's a lot of individual differences there, isn't there? Well, there are without a doubt. Uh, and and I, I was working at one particular club um, and it was the youth team, and mm. it was probably the early days of uh, academy football, E Triple P, uh, facilities getting better, pictures getting better, which coincided with the football that we see now, perhaps based on ticker tacker, where it's a lot on the ground, it's passing, it's moving the ball around in triangles. So the coach quite regular had eight v eights, uh, and the players were asked to move the ball around and keep it off the opposition. And after two weeks of watching this, I had a common theme that the coach stepped in probably within four or five minutes every session and said, the standards aren't good enough. There's too many mistakes. We can't move the ball around. You haven't got pictures in your head. You can't see the options, etc. And that narrative went on and on and on. So I asked him, I said, can we do an experiment here? Would you mind if I tried something? Uh, great coach. He said, what are you thinking? So we sat down and I explained what I'd seen in terms of this repeated poor performance and same thing happening ground dog daytime after he said, yeah, you're right. Uh, and I'm open to anything that will fix it, which I thought was great. Uh, and he said, my job is to help to try and educate these players, and improve these players. And ultimately we've got to get in the first team. Uh, and yeah, I am boring myself with what I'm doing because I'm not getting anywhere. <laughs> So that was great for me. That was innovative and open uh, of him. So I asked him, I said, who's the template here? Where are we going? And it was Barcelona at the time. You've got Iniesta, Xavier, et cetera. They're just keeping the ball for hours and hours. So we use YouTube clips uh, and we just sent them as text messages. I think it was the day before, days before WhatsApp. Uh, And I asked the players to look at them. There were only two minutes. And I just said, this is what we're looking for in training. It was simple as that. So at first, the players are, "Mm." so you get in the dressing room and you ask them if they've watched it. Invariably, let's say we've got 16 players, six or seven would say yes. Uh, Training, probably the same at this point, uh, but the players are clearly getting fed up of getting admonished as well. They don't want to perform badly. So as it progresses, you get to about 10, 11 players watching it. And then all of a sudden, the coach highlights something that a player's done, but relates it back to the video that we've watched. So then the player's thinking, ooh, I better start watching these videos. So they did, and the coach was more referring back to the video. So we've got this it's a bit like being at school you don't really listen to the teacher but when a different teacher comes you listen to them and you're not listening to your normal teacher simply because you're just used to them you've had them day after day after day (laughs) um and he's also referring to a role model they're thinking oh well if it's good enough for Iniesta then it's good enough for me so you're using this role model or idol concept then I progressed it to ask the players to write down what is it for you what will make you better and you're getting things such as get wider, open my body up, uh, try and play one touch instead of two touch. And then the coach is prompting this. So it basically grew to probably an A4 sheet filled of tactical, technical and physiological information that would help. The players got better. Uh, This particular possession drill uh, got better. We played good football. Uh, The club I was at was successful. It got players through. 
Now, I'm not saying that's because of that in- intervention. It could be cumulative practice because they'd actually been at it for a long time prior to that. Uh, but what it did get was engagement. It switched to light on. I probably wasn't the solution, but I probably helped polish up some of the groundwork that this coach had been doing and these players and probably shone a light on a few things. But it was done in a cognitive manner through watching video and through writing things down. And if we look at the modern world now, I was looking at something the other day. The average child, I think it's between 8 and 16, is spending around six hours a day in a digital medium, whether that's social media, Facebook, WhatsApp, YouTube, etc. So we know that children live in this world uh, and they learn from this world because they pick up language from this world, they pick up behaviours from this world. So why wouldn't you be able to facilitate football education in this world as well. And video analysis through modern technologies is now, it's in schools, it's in grassroots football clubs. Uh, There are coaches on the sideline and it's fine to to do it. They've got the phone out to get passages of play to show back to a child. We live in a world where there are voice notes now. So within a group, you can ask a child, so how would you go about a possession session? then they can just speak into the phone for 15, 20 seconds. But what we're getting here is cognition and thought because none of that is physical action. So that's sort of the modern world of what I unearthed over a decade ago in terms of Gary Neville's behaviour because as sort of scientists, educators, coaches, psychologists, whatever we are, our responsibility is to educate the next generation and to educate the coaches that are educating the next generation but tap into the tools that are going to drive that. So I've sort of, I've not seen it go full circle. I've seen it progress really, for want of a better word, in terms of what's available to us now from a cognitive experiment I did that was deliberate practice, watching YouTube, talking and writing things down that is part of the hours that lead to expertise. I love everything you're saying, David, and and it's making me think. I mean, so many different things in terms of, um, I mean, WhatsApp as a sports psychologist working at the coalface, whether it's with individual players or with teams, WhatsApp is my best friend yeah. because that's I, I just find it so useful to send videos, videos of my, my, myself talking about a specific concept mm-hmm. or introducing a concept, which you can now do rather than having to rely on being in a room and people can watch it at their at their leisure. Absolutely. Um, sending there's so many great videos now of, of uh, you know sporting icons like uh, LeBron James or Serena Williams the late great um, Kobe Bryant talking about um, you know mindset stuff and and everybody's a lot more open now in terms of um, not just mental skills but mental health but what you were making me think of there specifically is the importance of mo- uh, taking a mo- multimodal approach to coaching yes. you know and that that could be seeing it could be it, it could be actually delivering from an instructional perspective it could be watching a video it, it, it could be somebody talking into their phone it could be writing down that rich sensory experience why is the brain which comes back to your you know notion of long-term memory there you know mm-hmm. and it was also making me think i mean just being real putting my real psychologist cap on here you know when your players were watching the videos the classic sort of albert bandura sources of self-efficacy the vicarious experience you know Absolutely. if they can do it i can do it they're doing it it's worth us doing yeah and you know you mentioned bandura there you, you look at children you go back to a child a mother or a father, when they're getting the child to eat and use a spoon, they'll often they'll, they'll do it themselves right in front of the face of the child. So they will then mimic that behaviour and pick up the spoon. And that's all we're doing, really, with possession football. Ultimately, it is Bandura's modelling. Hey, look, a last question, just, just on individual differences, um, reading through the paper, which I recommend everybody does because it's, it's, it's full of rich information. Um, Obviously, Gary, now we, you know, we're talking about decision making. We're talking about deliberate practice, uh, preparation. Um, and we talked a lot about preparation 
today, but individual differences in preparation. Obviously, Gary Neville is talking a lot about thinking about the players he's going to be up against, um, perhaps watching watching them, perhaps utilising training for him to rehearse physically how he's going to deal with a, a specific opponent, uh, and also talking to teammates about how they can help him to deal with opponents. Equally, individual differences, you know, and I, I'm probably... This is a bad example because this is a, a unicorn in a land of unicorns, Lionel Messi. But he, <laughs> he's spoken of, yeah. you know, I don't really think about the game before I go out. I just look around and I let the game unfold. And yeah. then I'm, I, I've listened to him talk about this and I would still define what he's doing as thinking the game. He's mm-hmm. thinking through the game as he's out there. Yeah, because he... He yeah, wa- he watches yeah, he it. Watches it. Yeah. He's observing and he's he's processing and he's calculating. But it it, it is interesting. This I've definitely worked with players. Again, individual differences. Again, possibly to do with learning preferences and, and cognitive capacities. Some will just say, "I can't think about the game. I just can't think about that. I need to go and play." No question. David, but I, I'm assuming on your psychological travels, you've experienced the same sort of conversation with players. Definitely. Uh, you've got at the other end of the scale, uh, if someone engages in this level of thinking, that could produce anxiety. Yeah, well uh, said. And it could, it could, it, it could destroy performance. Yeah. So you, you have to be very mindful um, of knowing your players. But we, we said this right at the start, I think, knowing your people, the human beings, uh, they're not a robot or a machine that plays football. So be mindful, just like you would in a physical capacity. You you wouldn't ask a small child or a small player to lift extensive weights. You you know, I mean, I'm just pulling something out there, but Jesse Lingard is not going to be bench pressing the same as Harry Maguire. (laughs) If you take that into a thinking world, you've got to tread with caution in terms of what you're doing. It is a tool that is available to us. It works for some, but just like too many weights will destroy or tear the muscles of one player, too much thinking could be anxiety. That could be panic attacks. I mean, in an extreme case, it could be the end of a career because they then can't be formed because all their physiological energy has gone on panic as opposed to, I've not seen that, don't get me wrong, but I'm just trying to get it across that it isn't one size fits all. Yeah, yeah, no, well said, well said. David, what a fantastic, rich conversation. I can't thank you enough. Absolutely brilliant. Um, my my mind is uh, abuzz with different ideas and different thoughts there. So uh, it's, it's, it's an area I'm so, so passionate about. And just sense-making around these areas and how they link together and join up and how they, they, they join up within the coaching process. I just think there's so mm-hmm. much that we can do in the world of sport to help coaches um, think about and improve upon their processes within their practice when it comes to all of this stuff and more and i know that you will have tapped the interest of everybody listening in so how can people find you follow you and uh, get in touch and potentially get hold of this paper um i'm on linkedin that's probably the primary social media uh, okay. i'm also on twitter as horrocks david uh, and i work for a company called mike and coaching.com uh, the ex-Manchester United coach. Uh, there is a website that uh, is actually undergoing renovation at the minute and there are contact buttons on there. I- I'm part of that particular coach education group. But by all means, reach out. Uh, I can send the paper to people. That is not a problem. Uh, and you've got a copy yourself, Dan. Feel free to share it, anyone that's interested. And hopefully... People do find it of use, but if there are questions, ask. I'm uh, I'm here to help, really. Brilliant. David, thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Well, everybody, I really enjoyed that podcast, and I'd love to hear what you, the listener, think. So please do get in touch via X or Facebook or through my website, danabrahams.com, to tell me what you think of the show. And if you do have any suggestions, I'd be delighted to hear them. I'm already looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now.